My name is Ed Hannenberg, and I teach in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here at John Carroll University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and final lecture in a series of lectures uh, marking Pope Francis's Synod on the Family, which concluded in Rome over the weekend. Uh, it's a lecture series that was made possible by um, a number of groups on campus coming together to help sponsor it, including the Catholic Theological Society of America, the Green Chair in Catholic Theology, the Institute for Catholic Studies, University of Michigan and Identity, the TUI Chair in Interreligious Studies, and a number of other groups and organizations. So I want to thank those um, sponsors for their support. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our um, speaker for this evening, Dr. Julie Helmlund Rubio. Dr. Rubio is a Professor of Christian Ethics at St. Louis University, where she has taught since 1999. She holds a BA in Political Science from Yale University, a Master's of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD in Religion and Social Ethics from the University of Southern California. Dr. Rubio's research explores Catholic social thought, with particular attention to family, sex, and gender. She has published dozens of articles and academic essays, and has written or co-edited four books, including A Christian Theology of Marriage and Family, and Family Ethics Practices for Christians. Her latest book, which is due out next year, is titled Hope for Common Ground, Mediating the Personal and the Political. In it, she attempts to move Catholics beyond culture war divisions to dialogue on poverty, marriage, abortion, and end-of-life care. As a Catholic theologian writing on marriage and family, and as a married Catholic herself raising a family, Dr. Rubio has followed with interest the Synod on the Family. She concludes our series tonight by bringing it all home, asking what it might mean to cultivate practices of love and solidarity within the domestic church that is the family. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Hamlin. Thank you so much, and thank you um, for being here tonight on what I guess is going to be a rainy night, um, and for coming to a topic, to hear about a topic that I find um, is difficult sometimes for people. Sometimes when people invite me to think, they think, oh, it's, we're in a parish or a Catholic center, and lots of people come because it's about marriage and family, and everybody cares about marriage and family. But often you can get more people to come out when you want to talk about a controversial issue than when you just talk about family. And I tend to think that that is because when there are discussions about family, especially in the church or in a Christian setting, people worry that they won't feel so great at the end of the night. Which is why I think it was so masterful for Pope Francis to have this synod around the family. Because as the Pope of mercy, he so knew that people needed mercy in their lives, especially around issues involving sex, marriage, and family. But I'm going to plunge ahead anyway, also knowing um, that it takes maybe a little bit of hubris to stand up in front of a crowd of children and parents and grandparents and talk about family ethics. Um, but I hope what you'll hear tonight um, convinces you that I don't think I have all the answers. What I will talk about tonight is coming from now 21 years of parenting, and it definitely sounds a little bit different from the book I wrote in 2003 when my children were toddlers. And I assume it will sound different um, in another 10 years or so. Tonight, I, I want to pick up on some rich, what I would call ethical debate, cultural debate, about what good parents do. I think that we hear a lot about the ethics of parenting. We hear about attachment parenting. Should you carry your children, co-sleep with them, nurse them for a couple years, right? And have them with you all the time. 
Um, or should you be a free range parents, parent like the French and allow your children to go to the park unsupervised, play on their own, walk in nature, even ride the subway? We have helicopter dads who hover around their children mercilessly, and we have tiger moms who are so concerned about their children's success, they can be a little overbearing. And now snowplow parents, this is the latest I think, who clear obstacles out of the way for their children to have smooth sailing. And there are real issues, real concerns, I think, um, that go so far beyond uh, some of the more controversial family issues. How much freedom do you give children? How much guidance do they need? How much failure should you allow them to experience so that they have grit? How much love, how much nurture do they need to have? And underneath all these questions are, are about what parents do are, are questions that are larger about what are we, what are we trying to do anyway? What, what are we going for? Christian parenting historically speaks of something different than raising happy children or successful children. It speaks of a primary duty to form children in the faith, to raise up, in the words of one famous Christian theologian, athletes for Christ. And the early church fathers, who were writing in the early centuries of Christianity, often blamed parents if their children did not continue in the faith. They even said that the, the parent, if, the, if your children weren't, weren't in the faith, probably you were going to hell as well. Now we don't hear this language today, um, but it's there in the tradition. And even still, there's this central idea that the main thing that, that parents are supposed to do is raise their children in the faith. And yet today we know that 23% of Americans, 35% of millennials identify as nuns. People familiar with this term, the nuns, right? So that when asked which re religion do you affiliate with, now a larger and larger percentage are saying none. And that graph has gone steadily up since 1990. It doesn't appear to be stopping or leveling off. Nuns are an interesting group. Um, some of them are agnostic and atheists. Some of them are spiritual, even religious, but not unchurched. Some of them pray. But they often think about religion as hypocritical, judgmental, insincere, as emphasizing rules over spirit. Or some of them have a more benign view and just don't think religion is necessary. You can be a good person without it. And we know that religious inheritance, or the passing of religion on in families, is, is less likely today. It's less likely in interreligious families, which are where uh, parents come from different faiths, which are more common. It's less likely when there's divorce, which is more common, although leveling off. And we know that Catholics have a particularly difficult time with it, as about a third of those who are raised Catholic are no longer Catholic, leave, and if we count those who are non-practicing, it might be as high as two-thirds. So then, what does it mean to parent well in a Catholic context? I think it's a difficult question. It's a question that I would imagine all of the parents and grandparents in the room struggle with. It's a question that I started thinking about, believe it or not, when I was a student. Um, I wasn't planning on getting married anytime soon, and I didn't, really. Um, I didn't take any classes on marriage and family, but I would go around talking to people. What do you think, right? How, how should this work out? Because I think I had the space to think about what it was that my parents did well and what things I might do differently. <laughs> right? To look ahead to the future, to think about what a good family would be. Tonight, I, I want to proceed in this way. I want to argue that parents ought to prioritize a certain end that they're seeking. I'm going to use the language of virtue ethics to talk about that. I'm going to put distinctive practices in the context of that end. And then I'm going to pull back and say, even though I've advocated all these practices, it's actually really complicated <laughs> to have a distinctive practices in a family. 
And I want to conclude by using some of my, uh, the favorite, my favorite parts of Pope Francis's writings to help us think about what it means to deal with otherness even within families. Francis has talked about it in the church and in the world, but I think it actually applies to our families as well. And that's where I'm going. So first, the first part is on parents and virtue ethics. I think sometimes people think about parenting in terms of rules. I'll take this so I can move a bit. In terms of rules, so do my children go to church? Are my children married in the church? Are they cohabitating? Are they in a same-sex relationship? Those kinds of rules come out. I'd like to suggest that we think about parenting instead as a practice, an activity. So parents aim to be virtuous, aim to be good, and raise virtuous children. In virtue ethics, unlike in, in ethic of principles, right? in ethic of principles, we ask, what, what's, what's the principle? How does it apply? Is, are there exceptions? In virtue ethics, we ask, who do I want to become? Where am I going? What kind of person do I want to be? And how do I get there? Right? And particularly, what are the kinds of actions or practices I need to engage in in order to get there? So with reference to parenting, then, what do I want my children to be? And how might I try to help them get there? The thing about virtue ethic is, ethics is that it's kind of vague. We all can be for courage and justice and temperance, but we mean different things by those things. Aristotle meant one thing. I think tiger moms and helicopter dads mean another thing, and Christians mean another thing. So in order to make sense of virtue ethics, you need to think about your tradition, because that puts meat on the bones of the virtues. In classical Christian theology, what Christians are aiming for, our tradition, is says that we're aiming for an ultimate end, which is some kind of union with God. People use all kinds of language to try to put words to a reality that we can't completely put words to. Say things like beatitude or the all in all, union with God and others. That's the end, the point of our lives. Not so much get to heaven and avoid the fires of hell, but achieve that, be that union with God and with all humanity. If that's the ultimate end, then perhaps Christian parenting means raising children in a, such a way that they're preparing for that. If we think about churches in those terms, then churches become not places where you go because you have to or else you're breaking the rule. Um, but more places of formation, places of celebration, places where you put it, are put in contact with people who are um, heroes or saints, people who are really practiced in the virtues, people who can engage you in living in a certain way and support you along the way. If that's what a church is, then perhaps families who are sometimes in the Catholic, contemporary Catholic tradition, especially called domestic churches, are something like that. Right. Something like that. Places where we all learn and try to be better. Places where we also make our worst mistakes and learn sometimes how, how, how badly we mess up. Right? But places where we learn by trial and error how to be better. But what do we mean, again, by better? I think that sometimes in the church, we have a pretty narrow view of what that means, especially when we're talking about families. We give them a narrow end. But even someone like John Paul II, who sometimes is seen as kind of traditionalist or even conservative, although I don't think that's completely fitting, um, had a much broader view. And he put this in what I would say is our most authoritative document on the family, even to the present day. It's from 1981, Familiaris Consortio. I'm not going to talk much about it today, but what I do want to say is that he gives to the family four different tasks. The first two are things that you might expect. 
forming a communion of love. So two spouses growing deeper in intimacy and love. Although even that is a lot more than say, just stay together and don't get divorced, <laughs> right? It really is about growth in intimacy and union. And then number two is about serving life, which ordinarily means welcoming children, but also is extended into spiritually serving life by bearing fruit in your relationship in other ways, by valuing life and society. So far, okay, right? But then he, he really says, you know, that's not enough. <laughs> Happy marriage, good children, not enough, right? But that actually the family, as a family, has a mission to shape society, to work for justice in the world in its own specific way, and it has a responsibility to be the church, not just go to church, but be the church. Right? Be a light in the world. Right? I would say that these kinds of tasks orient us not only to virtue of love, the virtue of love, but also to solidarity as a virtue. If solidarity is, in John Paul II's words, uh, a firm and persevering commitment to the common good, right? Because all are responsible for all, he says. It goes beyond the, the sphere of our home, for sure. Right? So perhaps, instead of thinking about simply forming children in the faith, we could think about forming children and parents, right? in virtues of love and solidarity. But how, <laughs> right, but how? There's a lot of interest right now in ethics and the concept of practices, right? Especially because many people are convinced that we don't, ad don't adopt intentional practices. We're going to sort of be swept up <laughs> in the ocean of the culture. So you'll end up right, spending your time on things that maybe you don't intend to spend your time on, things that aren't necessarily forming you in the ways that you want to be formed. And so there's a need for formation, and especially in the midst of the busyness that we're all so familiar with. In my own version of family ethics, I try to draw upon the Christian tradition to look at very basic family action, some of which most families engage in, some of which maybe most families don't, or at least not in this way, in order to, to start a conversation about how, how we might engage in those practices in a more distinctive way. So the first practice I have, oddly enough, perhaps, is sex. I didn't originally start there, but I eventually decided I had to start there. And here, right, instead of asking what's the rule, right, does it apply here, are there exceptions, that kind of ethics, I think about sex as something that is oriented toward virtue. So I ask sort of odd questions that I also ask my students in our sexual ethics class. What sort of sex ought married people to have? What goods ought they to seek? Right? What would it mean to have a virtuous sexual relationship? Right? And you can imagine those are odd questions at the beginning. Um, but, but once we get into them, they make a whole lot of sense. Right? So if, if we're going to draw on the tradition to think about sex, well, many people say, well, what are you going to draw on? There's a lot of negativity there. Um, and there is. There is. But we also have beautiful things in the Christian tradition. We have the Song of Songs, the beautiful love poetry of the Hebrew Bible that Christians have interpreted spiritually, but really read it, right? It may have spiritual dimensions, but it's also very much about desire and passion. We even, even the concept of one flesh unity, right, from Genesis, means, as scripture scholars tell us, that people become one flesh, become, become relatives, become family, but also it speaks to their sexual intimacy and to the enduring union that arises out of that practice. Today we have John Paul II's theology of the body and the whole idea that sex is a form of speaking one's total self-giving for the other. Right? 
In married life, then, we can think about couples who have a practice of sexuality that is not simply the romantic sexuality of youth, but a sexual relationship that extends over time, right? Through honeymoon years, right? Through pregnancy and maybe difficulties in getting pregnant, through the difficulty postpartum, right? Through the toddler years, when sometimes people are so busy, <laughs> sex can be a difficulty, right? Through all kinds of ups and downs, celebrations, unemployment, deaths of parents. Think about all the different things that people experience in their lives and all of their ways in which yet they come together again and again in this particular practice that is no one's but theirs. Married theologians sometimes talk about bodily belonging or how couples grow in, the, in their union over time and how that takes not just passion, as maybe the culture would emphasize, keep the spark alive, but also a commitment to be there for the other person, to sacrifice in the finding of a practice that is right for both. So sex, I would say, is not just sex. <laughs> right? It is if it's done well, Right? A practice that unites two people in love and gives them practice in loving of the other, right? Even the spouse, your spouse is always somewhat other, right? And for children, the witness of their parents continuing devotion to each other, right, is also a witness of love, right? What about eating? This is a practice that most families engage in. Most, and many are engaging in it more. Actually, as a lot more data has come out showing that family meals are associated with kids who do well in school and don't do drugs and all sorts of other things, people are having more family meals. Right? And that might be the end that some people seek with the family meal, but I would suggest that Christians need to approach it somewhat differently. From the tradition, we get, we get um, some attention to giving thanks, expressing gratitude at the beginning of a meal. This may seem minor, but there's something about pausing in the midst of a day, just pausing, right? Giving thanks for the abundance that is yours, Praying for those in your family, outside your family, who are suffering, right? There is a way in which that practice, too, is a training in love, a training in solidarity. Then we also have, from our own tradition, Jesus' scandalous practice of eating with sinners. One of the things where most scripture scholars would agree is that Jesus did this, right? It's there in, this, in all the synoptic, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners when other people who were situated similarly did not. It was something that he had to know was controversial, and yet he did anyway. And clearly it was a controversial practice. What can we learn from that? Well, it seems at least to leave those of us who also eat together with a radical model of inclusivity. It seems to leave very little room for us to draw lines and say, you can't eat with me, but rather calls for opening up the table to all of those black, white, and gray sheep in our families, <laughs> um, all of those, and, and even beyond that, beyond that, who do we call to our table? But in more recent theology, people are thinking even more about eating as a practice that is formative. Not only is there gratitude, not only is there inclusivity, but people are thinking more about how Christians eat with regard to what we eat. Right? So as we're eating, we're thinking, where are we buying this food? Right? What are the workers paid at that store? What were the farmers paid? How about the farm workers? How well were they treated? Is it fair trade? Right? Those kinds of issues become ethical issues. They become issues of family ethics. 
We also now are thinking about justice and care concern for animals. Right? So if we're going to eat animals, and the Christian tradition hasn't called us to not do that yet, although I think there are some interesting, interesting moves. Uh, but if we are, there's more concern about having those animals treated well. So did they, were they able to run around a little bit and see some light? Um, or they were they cooped up in a cage with their beaks cut off? Um, it's becoming a Christian ethical question in a way that it wasn't before, right? And then as we're moving to more global environmental concern, especially with Pope Francis' recent encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, we're called not just to think about other human beings and animals, but also about all of creation. If we're doing that, right? if we're doing that, then we have to think about how our diets impact the environment. Now, it may be confusing because lots of, you know, you hear different recommendations all the time, but there are some things that we can, we can take pretty seriously. Certainly, a, a, there's a fair amount of agreement that a diet that is with less meat, less dairy, right? probably more regional local foods, not all, but more, more, less processed, packaged food, that sort of thing is going to be better for the earth. So can families then think about how they might have to sacrifice in some other areas, because guess what, that free range meat is more expensive, um, in order to have an eating practice that is in accord with their understanding of justice for other people, for animals, and for the earth. And if they engage in that practice every day, what might happen? Right? Will that practice then be formative of them? Will it be forming them in virtue. What about service? This is a practice that I think all families engage in to some extent, and the Christian tradition calls everybody to service. Pretty uncontroversial assertion. We can just look to the story of the Last Judgment in Matthew 25, where Jesus divides people into the sheep and the goats, right? And the people on the right side, the people who are going to the heaven, the people who have served him in serving the hungry, the thirsty, the prisoner, the sick, the stranger. So that's not very controversial. And it's pretty radical when you think about Jesus didn't talk about hell all that often. Jesus didn't identify him with himself directly with other people that, that directly very, very many times. And there it all is in that story. And yet, most of the time, families are kind of excused from service. Right? We're asked to bring Christmas presents, baby supplies, food for the Thanksgiving basket, money for the auction. But beyond that, not so much. Students might do service. Catholic workers do service. Oscar Romero, is our, uh, Dorothy Day, our heroes most of whom are single. They do that, right? But families are so busy doing their own thing that they don't have time for that. So we're let off the hook. And yet, we actually end up doing an awful lot of service. Any of you who are parents in the room know this, right? You're asked to be at the school. You're bringing bagels for the soccer game, right? You're at the dance recital. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. Is it service, right? Recent theology challenges, I think, that model. And it asks families to think more about how their service might be directed to those in need. Particularly think about how we might reflect on the new book that is really making a splash um, by Robert Putnam, a sociologist. It's called Our Kids. And in that book, he paints a vivid picture of two Americas. Right? He begins with his own hometown, one side and the other, and how those with privilege keep getting more privilege, and those without keep having less. And there's just dramatic scissor graphs throughout the entire book. And Putnam says it used to be, when he grew up, that the resources were more equally spread around. But it's getting worse. Putnam calls us to think about the kind of service that we do and to whom it is directed. 
It makes me think about an event I attended a few weeks ago in my hometown of Webster Groves, which is what, like what it sounds like, like that suburb with the leafy trees and the old houses. And in Webster Groves, we had a 5K race. And my husband actually came in for it. But, um, and, and at this race, it was, it was Webster Groves in all its glory, and everybody was out, and everybody was volunteering for the race, and we were earning money for a very important cause, which was our schools. And we were raising money so that we would, our kids would have more resources that our regular budget would not allow for. But here's the deal. <laughs> Webster Grove schools are really good. Look it up, right? We're, we have some of the best schools in Missouri. It's probably not the thing that we need to be raising money for, right? It probably is not the thing that we all need to be spending that much time on a Saturday afternoon doing. What if we earn the money for Ferguson, which is 15 minutes up the freeway and has a lot more difficulties with its school system? Or what if, even better, we decided to get involved in all of the organizations and small towns in St. Louis County that are trying to work at some of the more difficult and pressing issues that come from poverty in our region? What if we spent our time doing that kind of service? I have to think that that kind of a practice would be more transformative for families as families would get us further toward these virtues of love and solidarity. And yet, I will be the first one to tell you, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Having intentional practices in a family is complicated because families are not intentional communities. Our kids, you may be thinking this, I know my kids do think, I didn't sign up to be in this family. <laughs> Right? This was not my choice. Right? I didn't ask for a theologian mom. Right? My son, who's a computer guy, says, how did I get born in the wrong family where they think that doing computer is something you need to limit instead of encourage? Right? Um, and even spouses <laughs> can feel that too. So how do we come up with these, how can we engage in distinctive practices when we aren't all on the same page? Take something like tithing, another practice that I um, want to adapt for a contemporary context. Tithing is typically 10%. Um, the vast majority of Christians give nowhere near that, not just to their churches, but to charity in general. Most Americans give about 2%, no matter what their income is. Mormons do well at tithing. The rest of us, not so much. Right? Um, I'm not suggesting giving all that to churches, <laughs> but I do think there's something about using 10% as a good gauge for those of us who have, have enough to give both to churches and to, and to those who are, um, who are working with people in need. But that requires scaling back. And in a contemporary context, it's really hard to feel like you have enough. That used to be our classic Christian tradition. Well, give your surplus away. But in our economy, we never feel like we have surplus part of the issue. And then how do we make decisions as a family about what to limit? When you tell your kids that it's not that we can't afford a game system, but we're, not, we're choosing not to buy a game system, that's a controversial choice. Right? Think about all the things that have become normal that might need to be questioned. Restaurant meals, trips to Disneyland, SAT prep courses, club sports, and yes, I paid for things on that list. Right. All of those things then, not necessary, right? but important, even pro-family, pro-children, and yet um, tithing might require us to question them, and how to do that as a family with lots of different voices and opinions is difficult. Think how difficult it is to engage in a practice of prayer, especially given the data that I talked about in the beginning. And it's not just those who become nuns, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, but also people are just different. 
Some people want to pray the rosary. Some people want to do meditation. Some people aren't comfortable with the whole concept of prayer, not sure what we're doing when we're praying, right? Some people are more intense in their faith, some people less so. So how do you gauge in a prayer, in prayer in a family which is not an intentional community? So the problems of, of diversity in families are real. I don't think it means we have to give up on practices. But it does mean we have to acknowledge the difficulty. So far tonight, I've been talking about a model of families as communities oriented towards certain goods. And I've suggested that if you really want your family to be about certain things, then you might need to engage in certain practices or in certain practices in a distinctive or a distinctive way. And yet, <laughs> I've said that it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to pull that off. Now, I know families who do this incredibly well. And it's very often been my own students who have come to me and told me about their families that have led me to be optimistic about practices. They told me about families who did, instead of you know, serving their own, or in the words of one of my favorite theologians, Dean Brackley, serving their own middle class tribe, um, have gone out and done other things with their time. I think also of a, of a student of mine, an Ohioan, I believe, who told me that in her family, um, at Christmas time, they had a practice of choosing names, um, as many families do. But then on Christmas Eve, they would come together. And, they, and the task would be to tell the other person how you saw them bringing Christ to the world. I was pretty impressed by that practice. We tried to adapt that in my own family for years and found some pretty amazing things, even with five-year-olds, even with 15-year-olds. Yeah. And yet there are times my children could tell you stories that practices have been very difficult. They, their stories of the Catholic worker are not the stories I thought they would have. <laughs> right? They talk about the disorganization, how uncomfortable they felt when we went there to cook meals for people. And though my students would tell me these stories that would convince me that this was a great thing to do because they loved it so much, I'm not sure looking back it was the best practice for my kids, right? That possibly we might have had to have more dialogue about the most appropriate practice for our specific family. So how does Pope Francis help us think about that? Most of the press about the Synod on the Family has been on controversial issues like how do we treat gay people in our congregations? What about those who are living together? And especially what about those who are divorced and remarried? And is there a pathway for them to receive communion? But I think there are lots of other family issues, the kinds of things we've talked about tonight, that also are very deserving of attention. And, and the wisdom of Pope Francis, I think, applies there as well. One of my favorite um, quotes from him is this first one on your, on your sheet, if you have it, um, that talks about the weeds, right? And he's talking about a church in evangelizing community is concerned with the fruit it cares for the grain. It doesn't grow impatient of the weeds. And this is something, some, I did not just pick out random quotes, although they happen to be my favorites. They're things that he said early on in interviews. They appeared in his first major document, Evangelii Gaudium, The Joy of the Gospel. And they appear in the discussions on the Synod most recently. I love this quote because what he's saying is, sometimes in the church, we've looked and first said, I see the weeds. right? And we haven't been able to appreciate that there's fruit and there's grain there too. And you can see that he does this in his practice, right? He goes and talks to anyone 
and he manages to connect with people who have no faith, with people who have different faiths. Right? He even had a conversation, um, some of you may remember, with Fidel Castro. Right? And he was asked on the plane coming from Cuba to the US, you know, did you talk to Castro about all the ways in which he abused the church in Cuba? And he said, no. We talked about how he, he was educated by Jesuits, and those Jesuits are really hard teachers, and he really has a concern for ecology. He found the fruit. <laughs> he didn't use his first opportunity with somebody to be critical. He saw where they could connect. And people were worried about that. Think about the evil. The evil's there. He's not denying it. Um, but he found that. How do we take that into families? So I might, right, parents might focus on what their children aren't doing. For some of my students, it's the reverse. They come, they come back to their families after they've done intense service work, immersion trips, and they want their families to change. <laughs> and what they see is a lot of weeds in their families. It can be really hard to come home after something like that. And I think this, this passage calls us to see what is good, see where we can connect instead of what's not happening. The second part is about um, this, this word accompaniment. This is a word that I believe as a moral theologian I've never seen before appearing in moral theology. It's a word I associate with service trips, with doing, the doing of service. It's the way that we talk about service is not doing for or bringing a, bringing a solution. It's rather walking with people in their joy and their suffering, and then slowly finding ways to build on what is there. Pope Francis has used this word over and over again. In the Synod on the Family, the bishops have tried to talk about how do we walk with people in their family struggles? How, do we, how can we be pastoral with them, even if they aren't living what we think of as the ideal? In families, we can also think about that. If we're not all called to the same practice, right? perhaps we can still walk with each other. Right? For one of my sons who's uh, into music, service looks very different than it might for some of my students. But that doesn't mean that his heart isn't still a heart of service, that he isn't engaging in work that is good for others. Right? How can we walk with each other, allowing our practices to mutually shape and inform each other while remaining humble enough to allow others to lead, lead and sometimes and even illuminate Right? rather than being the one to bring the answers. Finally, this last quote, um, it comes from the, the end of uh, the, the closing parts of Evangelii Gaudium, and it's about, there's a whole section there on conflict. And if you want to know, how does Pope Francis pull this off? How does he deal with all this open conflict in the church? I think the spirituality of his approach to that is all in that section. He has, more than any pope in recent memory, um, welcomed healthy debate and conflict. He's encouraged the bishops at the synod to come together and speak their minds. He closed the doors so they could be frank, closed the doors. And he encouraged them to keep going. Nobody has been told, oh, you said that yesterday, you can't come back. Nobody's been told, stop speaking. Rather, at the end of the first part of the synod, last October in 2014, he, um, he closed the synod with this beautiful speech. And in that speech, he said, I would have been disappointed if we had not had debate like this. Right? I wanted this. And then he says, and I really, I, there are different concerns here, and I hear them. And you people over here are really concerned about rigidity and a lack of mercy, and you people over here are really concerned that people are too lax and are thinking they're being merciful, but they're really not. Okay. Cheap grace. 
and I get all those concerns, but we can't walk away. We need to come back and we need to keep talking. Right? And then in this document, we see why he, he's doing that, in this quote especially. Right? He says, to, to be involved in the conflict is to and not walk away or dig in and be overbearing, but to really be in, involved in a conflict in a virtuous way is to see others in their deepest dignity. Got to see beyond the conflict, underneath, to the dignity. And interestingly enough, he says, now that means we have to acknowledge that the unity is greater in the conflict. So for those of us in the church, sometimes, you know, so the unity of Catholic is more important than the unity of liberal Catholic or conservative or Catholic. Or for those of us in families, the unity of whatever we have as a family is greater than our differences. And then he uses the term solidarity. Again, unusual here. But that solidarity becomes the way of making history in a life setting where conflicts and tensions and oppositions can achieve a diversified and life-giving unity. So now solidarity becomes the virtue that actually allows us to enter into a conflictual situa situation and find a resolution which takes place on a higher plane. So when I'm entering into that conflict and trying to find a solution, I'm not, I'm not being weak. Right? I'm not even just being a good negotiator. I'm actually acting out of a virtue of solidarity because I care so much about the unity that we have. And I think so much that there's something that we can achieve together which is bigger and better than what we could achieve if we just walked away. And what would it mean to take that into our families? To be able to put the unity first and practice this virtue of solidarity, which would mean engaging even in difficult conversations, whether with five-year-olds or 15-year-olds or 75-year-olds, right? um, again and again, because we care so much about, about the person and the unity that we have. So I think in the end, I'm pretty convinced that do, being in a family today, being a child, being a parent requires a fair amount of courage, another virtue, as well as humility. And maybe humility is the most important virtue. If the early Christian fathers called Christians artists who sculpted their children, perhaps those of us today have to take a step back from that um, and think and said about virtues that we want to both inculcate and also live, right? Live ourselves. And we have to know that that will be difficult. Rick Gallardi, in what I think is one of the best books of marriage that an ordinary uh, theology that normal people can read, um, called A Daring Promise, he writes about the paschal part of marriage. He says, you always marry the wrong person. Even if you marry the right person, just wait. Things will change. Things will evolve. <laughs> it will be hard. <laughs> right? And it will require a certain dying of self. But then there will also be a rising that emerges from that. And that paschal movement of death into life, central to, the, to Christianity, is also central to marriage. I think it's also central to family. That also in parenting, there's a certain dying to expectations that we may have brought into the family, but also a growth and a rising that comes out of that. And it may work the, on the other side as well. So I would argue that families should then embrace this challenge of trying to form each other in virtues, to be a school of virtues. Some of those virtues are things like love and solidarity and hopefully contributing to the transformation of the world. And some of those virtues will be the virtue of solidarity and love inside the home. 
as we try to honor the otherness of all of the people in our strong, small, non-intentional community and walk with them <clears throat> step by step, little by little. And hopefully in this way, right. we become more of who we want to be. Thank you. Sure. Love to have your questions or stories, challenges. Yes. Hello. Get the uh, first toe in the water here. Uh, as you were speaking, uh, I found myself checking off all the boxes. You know, good sex, good meals, good service, all that kind of stuff. After almost 55 years of marriage, uh, we have found that. Doing it all the way you describe beautifully the ideal produces a fruit, but at least in our case, and I think this is the cautionary tale so you don't go home with a bad box of guilt from this talk, <laughs> you young folks, uh, that the fruit that we got with our family and our six children is very sweet and wonderful but it ain't what we were planning. <laughs> and uh, I, I see our children, none of whom go to church, saying that for them, the church institution, certainly before Francis, was very much a scandal for them. And so, but the, the things you talked about and the way you located the virtues did not preclude what Mother Angelica, of all people, said to one of her upset grandmas because her grandkids weren't going to church. God is calling people in a different way from the way we may have planned it to be. And maybe it's not in the Catholic tradition, much as we grieve for that. But that the virtues of gifting and caring and being generous to the world can be a part of that, and that is Catholicism alive and well. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And, the, and you have a lot more experience than I do to draw upon. There's a similar narrative to a group from St. Louis, uh, uh, James and Kathleen McGinnis, who, uh, who ran the Parenting for Peace and Justice Net Network. First book, very idealistic. Ten years later, a little more sober. <laughs> yeah. Others? Comments? Yes? Um, I've been very blessed and lucky with my mother, who's right here, just to show her off everyone. <laughs> um, my question would be, how can we relate this to bringing people into our family that may not be family members directly? We uh, had my oldest sister was brought in when she was a teenager, and we're very blessed to have her in our life. But how do we include opening our doors to others into our own family with our Christian tradition and Catholic family? I mean, I think easily in many ways, right? It, it makes all kinds of sense as a family practice, right? A Christian family practice, which is welcoming, which in welcoming the other, I mean, but I would also say that we also do that when we have children biologically. <laughs> just because they come from your body doesn't mean that they're going to be just like you, right? Um, <laughs> but there are different challenges when people come when they're older. Um, and also different negotiation that has to happen around what is this family about. But it seems to me it's more similar than different, right? As, as we're forced to, to accept, to honor, to see, to see all that's there, and then allow ourselves to be challenged by that, right? Which is not to say I'm not trying to diminish the difficulty, right? Um, but it seems to me that regular child rearing and adoption are more similar than we think. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. I've been impressed with some of your work on um, this discussion of the life of the parish and how that connects with family life. And so I'd be interested to hear what you think 
about how the parish plays into that because I know that's something we've noticed in our parish that we have um, programs for teenagers and we have programs for perhaps retired folks, but for families who are kind of in the middle, there's maybe not always a, a clear path to regular participation in the life of the church. And it would be interesting to hear how you see that fitting into this. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I do think, and, I, and this is what I'm part of what I hope will come out of the Senate of the Family as, as now priests and parish ministers try to take in some of the things that happened um, and bring them into their own life. I mean, if everything Francis is saying about justice and, and the poor is right, then it has to find its way into the parishes. And if that's right, then seems that, that maybe we, we might need to think about where we're asking people to put their time, right? So currently, in a lot of places, and if, I don't know if Cleveland is anything like St. Louis, but I think so, um, a lot of energy goes into sports, yeah. even on Sundays. Um, a lot, there's a lot of carpooling, a lot of driving, a lot of activities. We ask people for a lot in some areas and then some food for the Thanksgiving basket. So is it possible? I mean, I think what I see is there's all this energy. <laughs> or I think about all that goes into the room parties, <laughs> right? For kids who are already going to go out this, this week in Halloween and get tons of candy, right? <laughs> we don't need more candy, right, and crafts and things. Um, what if we took that energy and harnessed some of that in the parishes and we enabled, we provided opportunities for families. We enabled families to engage in service that was meaningful, in which they were in relationship with other families. That's what I was trying to do. I'm not sure I had the resources to do it well. There were some wonderful moments where we picked up kids from the Catholic Worker with kids from our youth group and we went to places in St. Louis like the Art Museum and the Botanical Gardens and the zoo. Um, and, I, and the kids were interacting. And that was great. Um, but it's hard to pull off for families. It's a different model. And so we, we'll, if we want to do that, that's going to take some, some resources, some energy, um, some time figuring that out. But yeah, it's hard to go alone. Hard to go alone. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Rubio. Toward the beginning of your talk, I was thinking about that line from Scripture where Jesus says, my family is those who hear the word of God and do it. So I was just wondering, if it, for you, to what extent is appreciating the family about exploding the boundaries of the biological nuclear family? How would you speak to that, given the concerns in your talk? Yeah, th that passage, as well as others um, that are, you know, Jesus' hard sayings on the family were really formative for me. Um, I, I think they were, when I first found them, I thought, well, Wow, this is the interesting stuff. People didn't tell me this before. Um, so, um, and that made me interested in doing a dissertation on family and, and writing about this. Um, so I think that, that, uh, that the first part of your answer is, is there's a lot, of, a lot of what I'm doing is trying to ex explore, expl explode those boundaries, disrupt those boundaries, um, and to try to think about families' responsibilities in much broader terms. So to link the social ethics tradition to the family. Um, and yet, I, I think as I've been uh, married, been a parent, um, as the words of Stanley Hauerwas, family or, family or the people you're stuck with, echo in my head, um, I do also see that there is a, there's something about that challenge, too, <laughs> of being with and staying with those people that you did not choose and who didn't choose you. <laughs> um, and there's, there's a part of our Christian vocation that is also linked to that that seems important. So I think I'm trying to rebalance. Right there. Yeah. Yes? I'd like to echo that thanks for your talk. It's very wonderful. I appreciate it very much. Um, in terms of the, uh, like the ends or the you know, teleology you're referring to, do you, in any essay or, or in one of your words, kind of lay out examples of let's say a husband does this and a wife does this and together because of their certain sort of orientations be it interests in you know maybe as a theology or philosophy professor and then a doctor or what have you like how their gifts or their interests kind of align with the end of the family or mm. something like that you know, case studies almost I have a 
haven't th been that specific, but I think that that would be a fascinating conversation, especially to hear how people themselves interpret that, right? Um, because I, what I wouldn't want to do is limit that, right? Um, I mean, it's right. It's part of the Jesuit Jesuit thing, right? God and God in all things. I mean, I mean, and that can get too big sometimes. But but it does seem to me that if we can if we can all think about our vocations in that light and the work that we do, um, and then bring that together, those would be really good conversations to have. Uh, giving our own interpretations and also challenging, right? One of my sons said to me when he was younger, well, you know, what do you do? I mean, you just teach. Why, why don't you become a firefighter or something where you're actually helping people, you know? Right? <laughs> right, it didn't seem very, very helpful at all, right? Um, and, or others, have, students have said to me, well, I don't, I'm not really doing anything for social justice because I'm gonna be a musician. And I think, really? Oh, but I think you, I think you would be, yeah. So we need all of those, we need all of us to see our work in that light and then also to make it even more so, right? Things that would be helpful. Yeah. Well, join me in thanking our speaker one more time. Thanks.